in one form or another. And I'm going to read from Mark, the 8th chapter, beginning in the 34th verse. He, that's Jesus, called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray, okay? Gracious Lord, be with us tonight. Be with my words. Be with our voices together that we might, in a manner that you know best, faithfully reflect your will and way. Find in us a graciousness for all people as we seek to follow you. In the name of our Lord, amen. You know, in the slow motion separation that is taking place uh, as we reconfigure the Wesleyan movement in America today, as we know it, I am reminded of a story that I learned something like four decades ago serving in the Rio Grande Valley. Now, my wife, Jolyn spent part of her childhood living in a Gulf oil camp in Oklahoma. And down in Oklahoma and Texas and in that area, you would have these Gulf, not just Gulf oil, but you would have these various oil camps. And they would often just build stock houses that people would get. And one of the styles was a house called a shotgun house. And it, it, some of you I'm seeing nod, you know what these are like. It's where you'd enter on a front door into a living room. There'd be a long central hall that was designed pre-air conditioning so that so that it could, it could let a breeze in and keep the place cool. And as you walked down that long central hall, on either side there would be bedrooms. And then at the end, often a swinging door, you'd push and step into a kitchen at the end, so you'd keep the heat in the summer sort of at that back end of the house. And the story I was told a good four decades ago is of this pastor who went out visiting parishioners, Thought he'd set an appointment to meet a parishioner at his home on one of those days, and he knocked and uh, and didn't hear anything. And he thought, well, surely they'd agreed to meet, and he'd be there that night, and and they'd get a chance to share together. But he knocked before the meeting harder, and there was no uh, very faintly from kind of the back of. The Come in, and so he. he the front door and it was unlocked and he opened the door and stepped into the living room and he said hello anybody home it's pastor so and so and hello come in come in and so he started down the hallway sort of looking in the bedrooms as he went down that central hallway and he came came to the swinging door into the kitchen he pushed that door into the kitchen open stepped in and was met by a huge ferocious German shepherd guard dog that jumped up on him, put a paw on each shoulder, slammed him up against the frame of the door, snarling in his face, and he turned over and said, come in, come in. And the guy couldn't resist it. The only thing he'd think of to say was, you stupid bird, can't you say anything else? With which the bird said, sick him, sick him. <laughs> Diller that said, can we, can we just talk? <laughs> okay, let's get real. For the very best of us. And the reality is, though, that to be sure, we can say something more than simply... Amen. We can be a people that do more than simply fight. This is not the end of Methodism. The global Methodist church is to be a part of a dawning of a new age in the Wesleyan movement of faith, not just in North America, but around the world, 
for a desperately needed Christian witness in a radically divided America and a bruised and bad world. Proclaim Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jew and Greek, Christ the power of God. Dramatic. Allow me to interject a plea here for humility and prayer to bathe our avenue and conversation. All across both the theological and political spectrums, there is evidence of such ardent conviction of righteousness, of personal belief, that humility is absent at times. I wish to emphasize my personal conviction that this is often painfully true of both the left and the right. And yes, confessionally, at times a part of my life in ways I wish it were not. Whether you are a convinced traditionalist, or a dedicated progressive, or somewhere in between, all of us who claim Christ is Lord would do well to embrace a biblical humility. And I want to invite you to join with me in seeking to live Colossians 3.12. You know how it goes. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, the scripture says, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. So let me pause. That's the backdrop I want to set for whatever is said. I want to add, by the way, as I gaze at President Millard, that I am proud to be a part of a seminary, United Theological Seminary, that I think tries to practice this as a part of our own collective witness. In fact, I'll drive there tomorrow morning to preach in their chapel uh, as, as a part of the team at United. Now, it's in this sense that I find myself in these tumultuous times going back again and again to W.B. Yeats' famous poem, The Second Coming. Some of you know how it starts. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosened upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosened and everywhere the, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. Now, it's clear to me, it is absolutely clear to me that, that however we may wish it, the center cannot hold. Yet this is not the end. It is a time of new possibilities. The historian in me would note that when in the past the United Methodist, the Methodist movement, rather, the Methodist movement is pulled apart, the combined total of both of the remaining pieces have been stronger than what was even there before. So I want to lift this up. Which I am honored and proud and deeply blessed to be a bishop emeritus in. By the way, the title bishop emeritus simply means a retired bishop. And uh, <laughs> so I like, my wife gave me a mug that says, you know, retired under new management, ask grandkids for details. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, so that's very true in my life. So this is the dawning, I think, of a new day in the Wesleyan movement. And I think a time, not to dread, but a time to celebrate. But to do so with deep prayer and with our eyes wide open. 
For with passion and purpose and Christ at the center, this is what we are about. And so I'd like you to see a very brief video clip of the Wesleyan, uh, of the Global Methodist Church. Could we show that now? that our mission is part of the global Methodist churches which you just saw is to worship passionately love extravagantly and witness boldly this really is the dawning of a new day with passion purpose and Christ at the center now what might this look like well, consider the following story. We gathered on a Sunday in the late afternoon in September of 2020. Despite the Texas heat, the setting was almost bucolic with a small copse of trees behind us as we spread out on a lake shore for a baptismal experience. An anointed young couple, Jesus and his wife, Lily, Melina, had come from Venezuela with a calling to preach and teach in America. Since arriving in Texas, God had blessed them with the birth of a young child, Paula, a beautiful little girl who is now one year old on that day in September of 2020. On coming to America, they had made their way to Corsicana, Texas, in my annual conference where First United Methodist Church's custodian turned licensed local pastor, part-time, had discipled them into the Wesleyan way of being Christian. Moving to nearby Waxahachie, Texas, Jesus became the worship leader at First Methodist Church Waxahachie's Spanish language service. The ministry continued to blossom under the leadership of District Superintendent Leah Hitty Gregory. They, they were recruited to start a new community of faith as a part of a covenant parish of five long existing congregations reaching out to unreached people with the gospel. The baptisms that night were the fruit of that new outreach ministry. Today, this new faith community has expanded to a second site in Grapevine, Texas. And recently, in May of 2022, that is less than a month ago, about a year and a half after that opening service that I was a part of, another baptism service was held at the same place, at the same lake. This time, 49 people were baptized, most of them adults. Now, it is significant, I think, that the Covenant Parish, which was aided and is aided by First United Methodist Church Waxahachie, is made up primarily of licensed local pastors. Hear that. Hear that. Only one of the leaders... Um, has a seminary education, a retired elder who serves more as coordinator than as boss. And what they have instead is a sold-out commitment for Jesus Christ as Lord. The movement of the Holy Spirit in their midst is just tangible. You can feel it. It's overwhelmingly present, both individually and collectively. 
they, they live their lives with this sense of having known negative judgment and rejection. Together, they intuitively have experienced Jesus as liberating in their lives. They speak easily, in fact, confidently, about the Holy Spirit being present and guiding them. As I waited in the water that Sunday evening um, in 2020 to share in the baptisms of five adults then, uh, uh, from late teenager to a person in the early 40s, and the one baby girl that I got to baptize, as I waded into the water, we did it with music and clapping and cheering. I mean, you know, this is a boy whose conversion came over here at Earlham College in Richmond, Okay. <laughs> And I spent my first years as, a, as an active Christian in a Quaker meeting sitting in silence. That's, not, that's just not my cup of tea. But it was a wonderful occasion. This scene would not be considered foreign, friends, or even unusual in early American Methodism. The Global Methodist Church is committed to a vision of life in a renewed local congregation where such worship and experience of the Holy Spirit is common. Let's unpack it for a moment, what that might look like. For it is instructive of the future, I believe, of a renewed Methodism which the Global Methodist Church is seeking to birth. A Holy Spirit movement, as you saw in the clip. The lakeside setting reflects a nascent local church of a renewed Methodism in the global Methodist church reaching a combination of middle class and working class in its makeup. The UMC of today and much of mainline Christianity, not just in the United Methodist Church, despite, and let me underline this very carefully, despite the best of intentions, has taken on a college-educated, professional class, culture, and ethos. Friends, the future of Methodism, whether it's global or united Methodist or free will Methodist or any other type and stripe, the future does not stand for upper middle class. But without apology... It will embrace working, a working class ethos and span multiple socioeconomic and ethnic groups. The building called church, I'm going to go from preaching to meddling here now, so hang on. <laughs> the building called church will not necessarily be the center of life in the global Methodist church, or for that matter, in any future Methodist movement, whether it's global Methodist or some other branch. Nor will it even be considered the locus of worship itself. Now, make no mistake, don't misquote me here. Buildings will still be needed, but they will no longer be the primary focus which we will revolve around maintaining a physical facility. Congregations which move from the UMC to the GMC with a mistaken worship of their building will soon find themselves in a hospice situation. Hear me. This is going to cut across the theological spectrum, folks. This is not restricted to the global Methodist church. It's not restricted even to the Methodist movement. It's all across what we call mainline Christianity. Hear me, building worship found in much of today's mainline Protestantism is not only idolatrous, Amen. but it is a recipe for death. That lakeside gathering, that lakeside gathering reflected a church culture and ethos oriented around Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. At its best, the global Methodist church will be different from and ultimately reject a footprint defined either by being culturally conservative or social justice in its orientation. 
This will not be something that's simply an echo of the Democrats or the Republicans. Under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, guided by the Holy Spirit, our preferences and predilections will have to bow to His purposes. You know, when we talk in that video about Christ at the center, we really mean it. That's what this movement is about. Christ at the center, Holy Spirit driven and inspired. It is the hope and prayer of the global Methodist church that life in the local congregation will reclaim an orthodox doctrine of the Trinity moving away from a vague Unitarian theological emphasis found in many of today's seminary educated clergy. Uh, I, I, I got to pause for a bit of boosterism. You won't find that at United. You'll, 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 find, you'll, find, a, you'll find a Trinitarian centered, historic expression of the Christian faith. The Global Methodist Church, at its best, will exhibit an expressive experience at the Holy, of the Holy Spirit, which at times will border on being Pentecostal in nature which is foreign to an upper-middle-class church culture in mainline Christianity. The elements of the lakeside gathering are almost reminiscent of John 21. If you're not sure what's in John 21, think of a lake and go ahead and read. <laughs> They're going to involve in a minimum seven elements. I, I, I want to take a moment and mention them. Those elements are life transformation in and through Jesus Christ. That is real conversion as a regular happening in a local church. A significantly new ethnic and cultural mix. Three, uh, both a working class and a middle class constituency. Four, what I like to call a high Christology combined with a strong sense of biblical authority. Five, a growing awareness of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Six, indigenous leadership that includes spiritual and theological formation as a part of its life, not just education. Though carefully, I really deeply believe in education and we'd be glad to tell you about the best place to go, but that's something else. <laughs> that. Number seven, a firm commitment to historic Christian orthodoxy. Now let me pause because I am not near done, and I am mindful that I meant to say at the beginning that I know you have a memorial service coming. If you need to leave early for that, please, I urge you to do so. I have presided over many, 13 and a half years serving as an active bishop, and I treasure that time. If the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us anything about life in the church today, it has taught us that our catechesis, that is to say, our training in what it means to be Christian, is woefully lacking. The global Methodist church will either anchor itself at the very heart of the Christian faith or it will be stillborn. Christian education and spiritual formation, not just knowledge, but formation of heart and life will go together and the small group structure will reclaim a central place in the life of spirituality in the global Methodist church, which is what formed the original Methodist movement in America. Let's be clear about this. Let's be absolutely clear that this will involve rejecting the dominant fads and fancies of a contemporary culture, regardless of whether they come from the left or the right. Dean Inge was correct when he stated, quote, Whoever marries the spirit of this age, the present age, will find himself a widower or a widow in the next. 
ultimately we in the Christian movement, not just the Methodist church, but in the Christian movement in America, have married the present age. And it is past time for that to change. You know, and I, I'm a bootleg historian, and so part of what's fun about being at United is just sitting at the feet of some of the faculty there. But, but we would do well to be guided by what Bishop Cyprian, he was the bishop in North Africa in Carthage in 256 AD, told his congregations in a situation not at all that dissimilar from ours in the second decade of the 20 or almost the beginning of the third decade of the 21st century. Cyprian wrote this. He said, Beloved brethren, we are philosophers, not in words, but in deeds. We exhibit our wisdom not by our dress, but by the truth. We know virtues by their practice rather than through boasting of them. We do not speak great things. We live them. Now the church's transition to a renewed Methodism through the GMC will be rife with casualties and resplendent with fresh outbreaks of the Holy Spirit. When U.S. Airways Flight 1549 began its emergency descent into the Hudson River. You remember what Captain Sully Sullenberger famously said over the intercom? Brace for impact. When this warning begs to be declared to us today as we transition in our local churches. We have become too domesticated too tempered in our reasoned response. It's time to remember again Hebrews 10.31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Annie Dillard's pithic, pithy comment written decades ago still signals a demarcation line between a discipled community of faith, which our churches are called to be, and the pale imitation of the culturally enculturated mainline imposter today. She wrote in Teaching the Stone to Talk, the churches are children playing on the floor with the chemistry sets, mixing up a bunch of TNT to kill Sunday morning. It is madness, she wrote. It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should be wearing crash helmets. <laughs> Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. For the sleeping God may awake and take offense. Or the waking God may draw us to where we can never return. My prayer is, O oh Lord, make it so. As the renewed Methodism struggles to be born in the global Methodist church, a part of the conflict will be a desire to nostalgically return to an earlier cultural ascendancy, often heretically cloaked in the garb of conservative politics and distorted cultural wars. The shrill clamor of a politically perverted evangelicalism welded to a vituperative rearguard cultural war is the precursor of a religious train wreck. I'm, hang, hang on, I'm, I'm not done. As such... Blind advocacy for conservative political values is a sinful millstone around the neck of an emerging post-Christendom witness. Now at the same time, let me weld these two things together. It's one long paragraph in my notes. At the same time, the emerging Methodism will take on 
will take on a different and altogether foreign hue from the progressive mainline UMC with its obsessive commitment to liberal politics, especially on the part of the clergy union, and a culture of personal freedom welded to a distorted conception of inclusion divorced from a doctrine of personal holiness. The truth must be faced, folks. I mean, we just, we just we got to do this wherever we are on the spectrum. Whether you're staying in the UMC or going to the GMC or you're a free Methodist who somehow stumbled into the wrong meeting. <laughs> you know? The truth must be faced that the reward for cultural respectability of either the right or the left has resulted in an emaciated church discipleship tragically lacking in allegiance to Christ and bereft of personal holiness and vigor. Nominal Christianity will not survive in a post-Christian climate, especially where the dominant cultural values of hedonistic materialism so clash so egregiously with core Christian claims Allegiance to Jesus Christ as both Lord and Savior must again be the heartbeat of a living faith community. Over and above what we want in our church, the mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ will gain a greater clarity and specificity as disciple-making is strengthened. And the global Methodist church, the global Methodist church must be built, I think will be built or it will die, by congregations which consciously see themselves as mission posts of the advancing kingdom of God. You know how we pray it? Jesus taught us to do it this way. On earth, say it with me, as it is in heaven. You see, you see, we hope to move beyond the cultural minefield of a mainline Christianity consumed with issues of inclusion, multicultural egalitarianism, and economic socialism. We also hope to reject the false piety of heretical prosperity gospel. The GMC, if it is to be faithful, will eschew the cliched therapeutic pamperings of churches which honor the cross in principle, yet pull back from the true meaning of sacrifice and service and especially suffering. One sign of this transformation will be very pragmatic and everyone will be able to see it. You will discover that over a measurable period of time, it will take a number of years, but it will happen that membership will gain meaning and committed purpose over worship attendance, which is a way of saying, we'll get back to where we used to be. We had more people who came to worship than you actually had members on the roll. Now think about it. There are other things that go with this. Make no mistake, the dawning of a, of a new Methodism and a new age for the Wesleyan movement as represented by the GMC will be both exciting and painful. Bishop Trimble was spot on when he said to me, you know, Mike, tell them to pray. I, I want you to hear that from two bishops, one in the GMC and one in the UMC, okay? So there's just no mistake about this. There's no mistake. It will not take place, folks, without genuine sacrifice. It just won't. Don't go, don't go home and, and, and kid about this. Institutionally, there will be dramatic change. Local churches will initially get smaller, while some larger regional congregations will thrive and, and survive. The clergy culture of a guaranteed appointment, frankly, is a dead man walking in either group. I could give you a long speech on that one. But. 
whatever the final form of clergy appointments and hiring will take, and it's unclear to me how that will finally come about, it will certainly in the GMC involve much greater involvement from laity. Bishops will focus on a teaching ministry over and above managing the institution. Connectionism for local churches will involve multi-linked webs of missional relationships rather than a bureaucratic hierarchy. The institutional life of the global Methodist church will evolve with a dramatically smaller bureaucratic overhead and counterintuitively, there will be a greater missional connection through local congregations voluntarily and often spontaneously joining together for disciple-making and, dis and mission outreach both locally and, get this, globally as well. Now, let me, let me emphasize three aspects to get very concrete here. The GMC will, number one, be explicitly uh, and consciously Christ-centered. As John Wesley said, what is faith? Is it what, faith, what, what, what faith is it then through which we are saved? It is faith in Christ. Christ and God through Christ are the proper objectivity. It is not a barely speculative, rational thing, a cold, lifeless ascent, a train of ideas in the head. Number two, the GMC will seek to consciously and explicitly reclaim a doctrine of sanctification, of holiness, of heart, and life. Now, let me, let me be clear about this. This is going to include both personal holiness and social or corporate holiness. Albert Cook Outler, the great Methodist theologian, came in this, to this distinctive understanding of faith. Or rather, Albert Cook Outler asserted that as far as uh, Wesley went, Wesley's originality, he said, quote, came in this distinctive understanding of faith alone and holy living held together. John Wesley believed and taught an explicit doctrine of holiness as the goal and crown, writes Outler, of the Christian life. You know, a, a great impetus for social justice has always been the hallmark of Methodism. The local church of a renewed Methodism in the GMC will continue a deep engagement in hands-on ministry with the poor, the marginalized, and the mistreated. It it will steadfastly refuse single-issue politics. Our understanding of Christian discipleship under the lordship of Jesus Christ, his sovereign rule, mind you, will unflinchingly be engaged in building a just society. It will do so in a manner and a style which is, which is not beholden to any political party or special interest group. By way of explicit clarity, let me give you a demonstration. If we are not actively addressing racism, we are not making disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, if the global Methodist church is to be faithful to the, its Wesleyan mandate, it will insist on an understanding of sanctification, as I said, that's both personal and corporate. It will also insist, by the way, on an understanding of sin that is both individual and corporate. Nowhere is this clearer than in the vision of the life of the great Methodist layman, Wil William Wilberforce. While this Methodist layman is famously remembered for his championing the battle to eradicate the slave trade in England, it is often forgotten that he was also engaged in a number of other moral justice issues confronting British society of his day. Under the more general rubric of what they called manners, Wilmerforce worked for social reform, including, by the way, early advocacy for the rights of women. In words spoken as a eulogy at his funeral, it was stated of him, and this is, this is, mind you, at, at Wilberforce's funeral, 
in the 18th century. Quote, in an age and country fertile and great and good men, he was the foremost of those who fixed the character of their times. Listen closely now. Because to high and various talents, to warm benevolence and universal candor, he added the abiding presence of a Christian life. Now think about that. I want to maintain that we in the GMC are to be about the business of adding the abiding presence of a Christian life. I think the third thing that I just have to say is that the GMC will be con consciously and explicitly engaged in evangelism. This will become a noted aspect of congregational life, so much so that bishops will ask you why you're not doing it. Often misquoted Daniel Thomas Niles, D.T. Niles, famous definition of evangelism makes the explicit connection between evangelism and offering Christ. Evangelism, he said, is witness. It is one beggar telling another beggar where to get food. But he went on to say, the Christian stands alongside the non-Christian and points to the gospel, the holy action of God. It is not his knowledge of God that he shares. It is God, it is to God himself that he points. The Christian gospel is the word become flesh. You know, not, not long ago, you will remember the famous story of the 12 boys and their soccer coach, football coach, who were trapped in a cave in Thailand. Do you remember? Uh, threatened to become their watery grave and a multinational, risky, daring rescue attempt was undertaken to find them and lead them to safety. Various rescue plans were considered, including pumping water out of the cave, other possible options include waiting out the monsoon through a massive resupply effort, drilling down to the boys' trap, some get this two and a half miles deep was even looked at and contemplated. Ultimately, you know, rescue divers led them to safety through narrow passages. Two divers lost their lives in that effort. Reports indicate, and I quote, that the rescue efforts involved over 10,000 people, including more than 100 divers, scores of rescue workers, representatives from about 100 governmental agencies, 900 police officers, 2,000 soldiers. It required 10 police helicopters, 7 ambulances, more than 700 diving cylinders, and the pumping of more than a billion liters of water from the caves. Now, a church truly engaged in evangelism will involve a dramatic change in the life of your local church and mine for most of us. Because it will operate not like those on the inside huddled together for warmth. It will operate like those on the outside doing everything they can to save those trapped in ultimately a lifeless existence. The early Christian community risked its own life unapologetically an evangelistic witness through heroic attempts to reach those in the collapsing Roman Empire. They did so even when they were persecuted for what they believed. Instead of being cocooned for safety during the times of epidemics, Christians reached out with medical help and often sacrificed their own lives while sharing the gospel of Christ. Going back to the future of a renewed Methodism, which I believe the global Methodist church is being birthed to give life to, will involve congregations which courageously 
reach out to those who do not know Christ. This will be central to the mission and vision of the GMC. Now, in her marvelous book, Teaching a Stone to Talk, which I've already referenced, Annie Dillard recounts the story of the 1845 Sir John Franklin expedition to find a Northwest Passage across the Arctic to the Pacific Ocean. Peter Scazzario uh, tells that tale and cogently summarizes it uh, in the background of this tragic expedition with the following comment that I simply share. He says, the men of the Franklin expedition knew it would be a two to three year journey, yet each sailing vessel only carried a 12 day supply of coal. Instead of bringing more coal, each ship made room for a 1,200 volume library, a hand organ playing 50 tunes, china setting for the officers and men, cut glass wine goblets, and sterling silver flatware. They carried no special clothing to the Arctic except the king's dress uniforms. And when the Eskimos came across their frozen remains, the men were all dressed up, pulling a sled full of sterling silverware and chocolate. <laughs> Hear me, that's, a, that's a true story. You can look it up on your own. 1845 Franklin Expedition, British Naval Expedition. Now, we are a people and a culture like that. We are all dressed up and frozen in place by the pursuit of lesser, petty gods. Our neighbors and friends, our nation and our world desperately need local churches of renewed Methodism in the GMC, sharing Christ to people frozen in place, clutching at chocolate and silver. This is the task which I believe the Lord creates the G global Methodist church to be and be about. No more, nor less. Jesus was right when he said those who wish to save their life will lose it. But those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, you know the rest of it? They'll save it. May it be so for us. Thank you. Thank you.